Welcome again, Christian friends, to our continued study of Jesus as a theologian. And as we have said, he is not a theologian of the type that we ordinarily think of, someone who puts his ideas into a series of very difficult to understand abstractions, but this is a theologian who casts his ideas into metaphors. And metaphor and drama are very close together. And so sometimes we find Jesus enunciating the deepest levels of his theology in drama, which he acts out. And of course, the climax of all of it is the cross itself, the great drama of salvation, in which our Lord is not only sort of acting out salvation, he is in the very fact of the cross, enunciating the deepest levels of his own theology. And one of the places in which we see this very clearly is in the story of Zacchaeus, again a story that we all know so well that we have to try again to rescue it from overuse. But turn, if you will, please, to the 19th chapter of Luke, and let's try and see just a few points of how this story or this drama unfolds in terms of its enunciation or clarification of the theology of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, in the text, first of all, we're told who Zacchaeus is. He's a tax collector and he's rich. And then we're told of how he wants to see Jesus, and so he runs on up ahead and he climbs a tree. Now, <clears throat> when was the last time you saw a wealthy, powerful man in your community up a tree at a parade? Now, you know, the man may climb a tree in his backyard when he's uh, in his grubbies trying to pick a, few fru a little fruit or perhaps trying to trim the tree or doing something. He may do it very cautiously, and there might even be someone who sees him. But ordinarily, wealthy, powerful people are standing on the reception stand for the parade to come by. And if they're not up there, they're standing politely at the back somewhere. It's little boys who climb trees at parades. When was the last time you saw any member of the cabinet of the President of America up a tree at a parade? Well, obviously, you haven't seen such a thing. It doesn't happen. And this is true in our culture. It is even more profoundly true in our Middle Eastern culture. Now, the tree which he climbed, which we've called a sycamore tree, is in fact a sycamore fig. It's the same kind of a tree that the prophet Amos would uh, gather fruit from, from. And these trees grow to rather large size, and the limbs are spread out fairly close to the ground, and they have a fairly large leaf. So you can get up into them fairly easily, and once up in them, you can try to hide, and you can, in fact, hide fairly easily. Zacchaeus, I'm sure, runs on ahead hoping no one will see him up that tree, because if they do, it's going to be very embarrassing. Now, as the crowd comes by, we find that when Jesus comes opposite the tree, he knows there is a man in it, and he knows the man's name. Now, you can say Jesus is the Son of God, and so thereby knowing everything, he can figure this out. That's true enough. But usually, whenever the text of the Gospels wants you, the reader, to assume supernatural knowledge on the part of our Lord, there is some such hint. The author will say, He knowing all things said, something like that. But in this text, there is no hint of that kind. We are not told Jesus, of course, knew because of who he is. Merely suddenly, he knows Zacchaeus' name. Now, the presuppositions of the story, I think, are a bit different. It seems to me that what the story is saying is that the people have seen him. And so, having seen him, there are some catcalls at the edge of the crowd. Now, they hate this fellow, mind you, because he's a tax collector for imperial Rome, whom they despise because they are imperialists and, and this man is collecting taxes for them. And more than that, this man is cooperating f with the Gentiles, and so thereby he can't really keep the law in a precise fashion. 
And more than that, these tax, tax collectors, we know, were usually people involved in graft. So he's been robbing these people blind for a long time, so they despise him. Now, crowds will do all kinds of things that an individual won't do, because when you're in a crowd, nobody is responsible. Nobody can walk into Zacchaeus' office and say, you are a so-and-so, but when you've got a crowd of people and nobody can tell where those voices are coming from, Zacchaeus can't blame anybody, and this is a golden opportunity. They've got the pole cat treed. And boy, the cat calls are going up. Now, Jesus stops. The crowd stops. Jesus looks up at Zacchaeus, and what is he going to say? Now, the mentality of the crowd is... There is a God, this God has given us a law, and there are two kinds of people. The people who keep it are the good guys, and they're the righteous. The people who break it are the bad guys, and they are sinners. We're the righteous over here, we keep the law. He's unrighteous, he breaks it. He can join us by going back to the law, observing the law, and coming down the line over to the good guys who keep it. So what Jesus is supposed to say to Zacchaeus is, Zacchaeus, these people hate you, as you probably know. And all the things that they have said about you and felt about you and thought about you and all of these catcalls are legitimate because you've been robbing these people blind for years and you have betrayed your nation to the imperialists and you are not a pious Jew keeping the law. Now, what you've got to do is confess the fact that you have failed God and man. You've got to start keeping the law in a precise fashion, and you've got to make compensation for your sins. And if you do that, next time through town, I'll check in to see how well you're doing in the good life, the life of law-keeping. And if you're doing well, I will drop in and have a cup of tea and grant to you my approval to the new law-keeping way which you have chosen to walk. But right now, you've got to shape up. If Jesus had said that, the crowd would have applauded. But that isn't what he said. And mind you, if he had said that to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus has got armor as thick as a rhinoceros. He's ready with all of the classic answers. And the answers will be, Somebody's got to collect taxes in this community. After all, it's like the garbage collector. Somebody's got to do it. I'm offering a service. We have to deal with these Romans somehow. It's not the most pleasant job, but they should appreciate the fact that at least I'm trying. What do they want to do? Talk to Roman officers themselves? Or w would they rather talk to me, a Jew? And we can at least come to some agreement. He's ready. Beating him over the head with the law will make no impression. But what happens? Jesus says, Zacchaeus, today I'm going to eat in your house. Now, I've been in the Middle East now for 27 years, and I have been guest a guest in many, many homes from very simple peasants to very sophisticated, well-educated uh, gentlemen in the large cities. And on the simple level in the village, whenever you are a guest in the village, you are always a guest of the finest homes that the village has. The point being, our guests should have the finest entertainment we can provide, and so, of course, the mayor or one of the elders or one of the patriarchs of one of the extended families will invite you for the meal if you are the guest. I have not been able to have a meal in a simple peasant home except in villages in which I was resident for an extended period, and so gradually I would let people to know, you know, so-and-so really is a good friend, and, and I, I really want to go to his house, even though all he can offer me is a hard-boiled egg and a piece of bread and perhaps a tomato. That's all I want, because he's my friend and I want to go. And sort of, I have to kind of carefully prepare the way before it's possible to me to go to some lesser member of the community without offending everybody else. So Jesus is the famous rabbi. They're not quite sure how this thing is going to come out. There are enthusiastic nationalistic elements that are also watching him. He's going up to Jerusalem at the time of the Feast of the 
of the Passover in which everybody remembers their political freedom from Egypt and everybody thinks something may happen that may be important for their freedom from Rome. And so there's lots of people gathered around and who is going to entertain the big man? Suddenly Jesus says, I am going to the house of the traitor of the community. Now Zacchaeus up the tree sees the costly demonstration of unexpected love. And the cost is mentioned right there in the text. It says, they murmured against him. This man is going into the house of a sinner. Doesn't he know that he's supposed to go to the righteous who keep the law? What's he doing going to these people for? And so here is Zacchaeus with this very costly demonstration of love, and it's a demonstration. It's in public. And the people are going to hate Jesus for having accepted, not accepted, but extended an invitation to his house. What is Zacchaeus going to do? His Roman overlords will not be pleased if he accepts. And if he accepts, he will have the responsibility of responding to a new relationship. Zacchaeus up that tree makes the decision to accept this love. And in the acceptance of that love, as we have defined it already in this series of studies, is his repentance. And as he comes down out of that tree, he is granted in the eyes of Jesus a new status, the status of a friend of Jesus, a new acceptance. And in biblical terms, the word righteousness is the right word. Zacchaeus does not become a righteous man after he does lots of good works. He is granted the status of acceptance and of righteousness on the basis of allowing himself to be found. All right? He goes to the house, Jesus goes to the house of Zacchaeus, and nobody lectures to Zacchaeus as to what he's supposed to do. In the middle of the banquet, Zacchaeus stands up and says, I am going to start my discipleship at this point. And it's within the framework of his profession, of the points at which are the deepest needs of his life, or as, he, as the Spirit moves in his heart as to how I have to respond now. An extension of love has been given to me. I have accepted it. I cannot be the same. I must now offer a costly love to others having received one myself. And so perhaps in the simple story of Zacchaeus, we have perhaps one of the clearest illustrations of what we have called the running of the infield. God in Christ reaches out in a costly demonstration of unexpected love to Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is in fact a law breaker there are other people around who are law keepers who are very nervous about this offer of love to law breakers. No, love should be extended, they think, only to people who earn it, who keep the law. His acceptance of being found is his repentance, his acceptance of the offer of love. He is granted a new status of acceptance in the presence of Christ. He is now a friend of Christ. And he now responds in thankfulness. And what a magnificent response it is, and we all know the story. The people who think religion is a matter of law are very upset because they think love should not be offered to sinners. And so we see the love offer, offered, we see it accepted, and we see Zacchaeus responding in gratitude for what was shown to him and given to him at great cost there upon the road. And so in our study this time, we look at Zacchaeus, and we also want to look at another story which speaks very specifically of a thankful response to having received a new offer of love, namely the question of discipleship. And it is not a mistake that this question of discipleship continues right there in Luke in exactly the same text. And so we read on in Luke 19, and I trust you have the gospel open in front of you, from verse 11, and Jesus tells the story of the nobleman in the far country. 
And so what is this nobleman story all about? I think that we have read our economic patterns into the story in a way that is perhaps not fair to it. And these I will try to point out as we go. We're told in the story about a nobleman who goes into a far country to receive for himself kingship and return. And calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten pounds and said to them, Engage in trade, and most of our translations say, Trade with these until I come. So the point, if you read it that way, is you've got so much time, you've got to hustle, and you've got to produce results. There'd better be some profits, or I'm going to be mad because I'm going to ask you about the profits on my return. That's the way we've read it. Now, in due awareness that this is a possible way to translate that Greek text, let me suggest to you that out of my study of this text in the Middle East, I prefer another option. This key phrase here, on the basis of the Greek text, can be translated another way. And it can be translated, engage in trade because I am coming back. Now, what is the point? I think the parable has a much sharper cutting edge when you see it this way. The point is, there isn't any king. This nobleman has gone into a far country to receive kingly power, which was precisely what happened in the politics of first century Palestine. If you wanted to be the king, you had to go away into a far country, namely to Rome, and the Roman Senate would decide whether or not they were going to appoint you king or not. And if they did, you would be sent back, and if they didn't, you ended up in chains in Rome. And there was a story about a son of Herod the Great to whom this precisely happened at the time of the telling of the story by Jesus. So they knew exactly the political background out of which Jesus creates this parable. When this fellow goes away, you don't know exactly what's going to happen. This last winter, I was privileged at the Near East School of Theology in Beirut to have two Iranian students. And these Iranian students, going back to be pastors in the Armenian community in Tehran, Iran, said that they had just been through exactly the scene that I was talking about, in which the Shah of Iran had gone away and he said, I'm going to come back. Okay, the Shah leaves, and now there is considerable uncertainty into the country, in the country because you really don't know. The whole situation is fluid, and who's going to take over, and which of the various groups are going to finally end up on top, and is he going to make it back, or isn't he? So you are an agent for the Shah, and you have been given some of his money, and you have been told, go into that marketplace, hang up my picture, declare yourself an agent of the Shah, and start business. Wow. If the Shah makes it back, okay. But if the Shah doesn't, and one of the Shah's enemies takes over, the heads are going to roll. I have lived in Lebanon in a time of, for seven years of political uncertainty. And in the days of political uncertainty in which you're not quite sure which political group is going to seize control, everybody pulls in their economic heads like a turtle and you sit there waiting to see who's going to win. It's in times of political security that you risk opening the new business and going into that marketplace with the new shop. So this fellow passes out the capital to his friends, and he says, you guys go down into that agora, into that marketplace, and you declare yourselves as my agents, and you engage in trade because I am coming back. There will be fear. There will be uncertainty. When you say that I have already been crowned, 
they're not going to believe you. But that's the task that I am calling upon you to fulfill. And sure enough, in the text, the very ne next thing that happens, we're told, but his citizens hated him and sent an embassy after him saying, we don't want this to rule over us. The word man is not in the Greek text. This is a Middle Eastern insult. You don't even call him a man. We don't want this to rule over us. And so this is now, I'm convinced, the stance of the Christian who is confident that our Lord has been crowned king and we are waiting for his return. And in the interval, we are his agents in the midst of a secular world which says we don't want this to rule over us. We don't want his standards of ethics or his attitudes toward life or his compassion or his principles of justice. No. We don't want this. You dum-dums who think he's ruler of the world, you've got to be crazy. In that secular society, we, are de we declare ourselves to be under his authority and to be his agents. And so when he comes back, that's the next scene, he returned after having received kingly power, and he, and he said to call to him those servants to whom he had given the money, that he might know... And again, I think our economics have allowed us to slant the translation, and we have translated it, uh, that he might know what they had gained by trading. This is a rare Greek word that occurs only here in the New Testament, and there is another option to our translation, and that is, how much business had they transacted? He wants to say, show me the ledger, fellas, did you guys open the shop on a late Friday afternoon for 15 minutes hoping that nobody would see? Or were you right in the midst of the struggle of life with your shop open, come what may, for the whole world to see that you were my agents in confident that I was telling you the truth, that I was to be crowned king in the distant country, and that I was in authority already over this land even though everybody didn't see it? and that I was to come back and receive, and receive authority? Where were you? Let's look at the ledger. Who was out there hustling and who was sitting by quietly hoping that no one would see? And so he looks at the first guy and the first fellow says, here I have, uh, I hear your pound. He doesn't say my efforts. Your pound has made 10 more. And then he says to him, well done, good servant. You have been faithful doesn't say successful. You have been faithful in what I gave you, and his rewards, mind you, are greater responsibility. I'm going to make you over ten cities. The second guy comes in and says, your pound has made five, and he says the same thing to him. Then the third guy comes in and he says, here is your pound, and I stored it in a rag, for I was afraid. That part's honest. And then he starts lying. Of you. He didn't have the guts to say, I was afraid that you weren't going to make it, that you were like the Shah of Iran. You just weren't going to get back. And things looked pretty bad. And when you were here, okay, but the minute you disappeared, who knows what's going to happen. And I was scared to death somebody else was going to take over. And so I thought, well, this isn't the time to start a new business venture. So having lied about why he was really afraid, or you could say he's not really lying, he was afraid of you in the sense of I was afraid that you weren't really in charge of things and weren't really going to make it. That's what I was scared of. I didn't believe that you, in fact, had been crowned and were in charge already one day to appear. And he says, I was afraid of you, and so I kept the rag stored. And because you are a hard man, taking up what you don't lay down and reaping what you don't sow, now, this has always been very complicated to understand. Why? Because it looks like he's insulting the guy. Now, when you're in trouble with the boss, it's not very smart to insult him. Ah, 
But we've got two basic kinds of people in the Middle East and have all across the centuries. And one kind is the farmer of the valley and the other kind is the Bedouin of the desert. And the Bedouin of the desert lives his life and has traditionally lived it through raiding. This is his primary lifestyle. He raids other Bedouins and he also raids people who farm in the valley. And so when you're, you look at the tr traditional culture of the Bedouin people and you find that the finest Bedouin is the best raider. And so in the love songs, the girl who, that they want, that the fellow wants, she sings her song to him, the fellow who wants to marry her, and says, how many horses have you stolen? And how many uh, caravans have you come back with? How much stuff have you gotten from the tribe that is our enemy across the valley? Or when the Bedouins would bury a man, they would say, shaking their heads, ah, he was a good man. He could steal in moonlight and in the dark of night. The better the raider, the better the Bedouin. He is able to swoop down and to harvest grain that he did not sow. And he's able to sweep through a village and take up what he did not lay down. Oh, man, you're a great chief, chief. Yeah. But you see, you and I, listening to the story, know that he's blown it. He has misjudged the nature of his master. His master is not, in fact, a Bedouin raider of the desert. His master is a nobleman of the valley. And now he's really in hot water because, first of all, he was chicken and he didn't think the master meant it. Was, was telling the truth when he said he was going to be crowned king. And so because he was scared, uh, he, he now uh, hid his talent that was given to him and didn't use it because he was not faithful. And now he's blown it even worse, having misjudged the nature of his master. So what is the judgment placed upon him? The master says to him, you knew, by which he means you experienced, to know and to experience in Middle Eastern speech is the same thing. Your experience of me was that I was hard and that I was a big Bedouin raider and that I took up what I didn't lay down and that I repped, that I would reap what I did not sow. Okay, this is your experience of me. Fine. The judgment upon you is that the dark glasses which you have with which you look at me the dark glasses which come from your own unfaithfulness not from my nature you see me this way because of your unfaithfulness and the judgment upon you is i will leave you with those same dark glasses who is the person who feels that God is cruel and God is unfair and God is unkind and God has no compassion? Look and you will find he is the one who has not been faithful. And it's the Mother Teresa of India who has seen more death and dying than any human being under great tragic circumstances whose face is radiant with the awareness of the compassion of a God of love. It is through our unfaithfulness that we discover and see a God who looks to us to be harsh and cruel and unkind. And it is through our faithfulness that we discover he is a God of love and compassion. The other fellows didn't see their master this way. This character did. He is condemned out of his own mouth. He is left with the false vision that his unfaithfulness has created. And what an awesome and a fearful judgment that is. It is not made in anger. It is made in quiet resignation that if we are unfaithful to what God gives us, if we are unfaithful to his promise that he is in fact, our Lord is in fact enthroned upon the heavens, already in authority over the world in which we live, one day to appear, if we cannot live our lives in a secular world with the confidence that we are to be his agents in that world, a world which says we don't want this to rule over us. If we cannot accept faithfulness in that scene, then our unfaithfulness will cloud even our vision of him. And that vision of him, clouded by our unfaithfulness, 
will be his judgment upon us.